the section this day that we're exploring has a lot in it. We are looking at how we turn everything inside out and what benefit that can have for us individually and collectively. I have some very, very favorites from the Richard Rohr teachings that we're gonna talk about today from the book, The Naked Now, Learning to See as the Mystics See. I love this section because it starts with one of my favorite areas of the Bible, and that's one of the wisdom passages. And um, I love, I love, I love the Bible. The scripture um, quotes around Lady Wisdom. Uh, and there is one in here that it starts out with that is just um, dear to me. I love the spiritual teachers that he pulls in. He quotes from so many wisdom sages um, in this section. And um, and then he makes kind of like a, a bombshell announcement. And um, we're not going to go into it today, but here's some food for thought. In this section, he says that Jesus, essentially he says Jesus was male in gender, but he had a female soul. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? He talks about Jesus as being male in his human carnation but with a female soul. And so that's something to dive into. If you've been following along with us each week and you haven't actually gotten the book, you may want to consider getting the book for your continued uh, mm, deep dive into what this book has to offer. He goes into the work of Ken Wilber. And I really think as a unity leader and a new thought leader, I think that Richard Rohr in this particular section does a truly incredible job at actually um, putting the unity practice into words, putting the unity teachings and the unity practice into words. I think it's one of the best uh, nutshells I've seen of the practice coming from a contemplative Catholic author. That's pretty impressive to give way to the unity message as a contemplative Catholic author. So kudos to Richard Rohr. I grew up camp. When it came time, as is tradition in the Catholic Church, to go through my confirmation, not my communion, communion is what you, happens when you're little and before that you have your baptism, but we're talking about confirmation, which usually happens in the teen years. When it came time for me to go through my confirmation, I had a sit down talk with my dad. I can remember walking into his office where he does his work. And I can remember pulling up a chair beside him and saying, let's just talk about this. Tell me about what confirmation is. And he went through and he said, you know, your baptism is when you're born and your first communion and all of that up to this point has been your parents taking this on for you because that's our belief system. That's our religion. And your confirmation is you as a budding adult taking this on for yourself, saying that you um, not necessarily agree, but that this is yours. This is what you believe. And I took a deep breath and I said, well, here's the thing. And then I asked him a number of questions about his beliefs, heaven, hell, Jesus. If you're born on an island, are you a sinner and you're going to go to hell if you never heard of Jesus or you didn't read the Bible? And I went on and on. And then I went into my beliefs. And well, here's what I believe or here's what I don't believe more accurately. And I said, so I don't think that I should do this. I don't think that I should do this. Now, if you have Catholic relatives or you grew up in a Catholic family, you know this is a huge rite of passage and could be incredibly disappointing for a parent. How many parents out there have dragged their children to church. <laughs> I can remember one Sunday. <laughs> this is one of the only things I remember that is like this, but I remember my mother pulling my sister to church on Sunday morning. And I, I feel like maybe she wasn't even fully dressed or didn't want to get dressed. And 
but somehow, and I'm pretty sure we were going to church, but it was like one of the only disciplinary moments I remember, but I remember being like, whatever you're wearing, you're going. So get in the car and we got swished in the car and off we went. And I know that is a struggle with so many parents because they want to give their children a firm foundation. They want to give their children spiritual nourishment. They want to give their children the support that they need to be on this planet and to experience themselves as a spiritual being in this human condition. And for a lot of us, we have gotten a great deal from religion or even more mindfully put spirituality and a spiritual practice. So here was my dad faced with this dilemma and kudos to him. He did not argue about it. He did not guilt me. He listened. He took a breath. He may have cried in silence after I left. I'm not sure. I don't know that we've ever really checked in on what that experience was like for him, but he accepted it. He heard me. He listened to the reason in my voice and he honored and respected my choice and supported me in that. I can't imagine that it wasn't difficult for him. But in that moment, I was faced with the paradoxes between the dogma and what I felt like I knew intuitively and I believed about life and religion and Jesus and God. Now, he is still in the Catholic Church. He found the gifts in the paradoxes, even though he answered no to some of those questions when I asked him, well, do you believe that you're going to hell if you're born on an island and no one ever tells you about the Bible or Jesus? No. Do you believe hell is a place that you go and you burn because you're bad and you're sinning and it's just the devil's there and you burn up in flames? No. But he has been able to, for his lifetime, have the capacity to be with the paradox. And even to receive the gifts from the paradox in a way that does not diminish the practice. In a way that doesn't demand that the dogma change to fit all of the little ideas that we all have in our minds but instead to move beyond the contradictions and the paradoxes into the heart of the gift of the spiritual practice. Charles Fillmore, Unity's co-founder, went on an adventure of exploring world religions and spiritual practices with the idea that if there is truth to be found, it can be found in anything. It can be found everywhere. It can be studied, understood, tested, and taught. But it, if it is to be true, you'll find it in Catholicism. You'll find it in New Thought. You'll find it in Judaism. You'll find it in Hinduism. You'll find it in Buddhism. You'll find it on an island. You'll find it on a mountaintop. You'll find it at the beach. And truly, even as the Dalai Lama teaches, you don't have to leave your religion of origin in order to find the spirituality of your soul. It can be experienced and within wherever you are. That doesn't mean you don't leave something and find a better fit if you want one. But it means that we don't have to be confined by the dogma if we're willing to see with what Richard Rohr calls the third eye. Now imagine if the world could get this. Imagine just for a moment if the world and the world religions could see this and could recognize that within any spiritual practice or whatever we call no spiritual practice at all, if just being human and being divine, if in this world of religions we could see that there is always the divine opportunity to get it, to awaken, to have a full-bodied spiritual experience, a coming home, a divine union within all of them. Think of how that would change things. 
Think of the wars we might avoid. Think of the hearts that may not break and the suffering that we would save ourselves from. I'm gonna share with you this idea of lady wisdom from scripture and how Richard Rohr ties it in with the practice of being present to paradox. So Richard Rohr in this story was talking about how um, someone was giving him feedback and kind of checking in with him and kind of like what I did with my dad. Do you believe this? Do you really believe that? Hey, do you believe this? But with the idea of like really showing him, really discrediting the practice, like then you're crazy to stay in this. You're crazy to believe this because this is just hogwash. So that was what was being presented to him. But he gave us an expanded way of looking at dogma. The idea that inner experiences can help us move beyond paradox, even embrace the gifts of paradox without having to radically change dogma. That there are a couple of ways to see dogma or religious teachings. There is the literal way, right? And then there's the metaphysical or the mystical way. There's the third eye seeing or heart centered seeing. The problem with paradox huh, is kind of the problem with anything. We can use it for good or we can use it for evil. We can use it to build up and break through, or we can use it to destroy and tear down. It will free us, or it will crucify us. That's the issue with paradox. And until we decide it will free us, we tend to use it and experience it for suffering. So Richard Rohr defines paradox as this. He says, something that initially appears to be inconsistent or contradictory, but might not be a contradiction at all inside of a different frame or seen with a different eye. Can you hear that? Inside of a different framework or seen with a different eye. Have you seen paradoxes? Paradoxes in scripture, paradoxes in Christianity, paradoxes in world religions and spiritual practices, paradoxes in, in the Bible, right? I've pointed this out so many times just because I love to point out our contradictions, but the scripture writers, and there were writers, <laughs> but the scripture writers left contradictory stories in there. There's not just one birth story. In fact, every Christmas, we celebrate a kind of manger soup <laughs> where we throw together the wise men, we toss in the king, we toss in this city and that city. We pool together a bunch of stories of different origins, calling them one and not really pointing out the contradictions. So we can either criticize that and throw it all out, pointing out how, huh, friends, the fact that we celebrate Christmas on December 25th is crazy in and of itself, because it wasn't December 25th. And if we celebrate Christmas without any sort of honoring of the um, solstice kind of movement of what came before this practice, paganism? Well, then we're not getting the whole story. We're not incorporating the whole tradition. But we can use these things to tear it apart or we can use these things to recognize the gift in that. And the gift in the paradox is that you have to take your thinking mind and you have to lay it all to rest to experience the spiritual message to experience the potential that the spiritual practice has when we take on the paradox and we take the gifts from the stories. So as Richard Rohr notes, we see 
with a different eye and experience from a different framework. The problem with not doing this, friends, the problem with sticking to our perspective, our reality, getting the story right, making sure we've got facts right, the problem with that is that it leads to extremism. It leads to rejection. Richard Rohr talks about transformed people often being killed by their group, right? We've seen this over and over again. Someone grows too much or they grow outside of the framework a little bit and they're going to be taken out. They're going to be taken down. So whether they're taken out by extremists, whether they're excommunicated, whether they're disowned from their family, whether they're invalidated, whether they have to wear the outfit of here's who I am when I'm with the Catholics and here's who I am when I'm with these people. Dancing that line, Don Shelby Spong is one who danced that line. Someone that's the same gender loving person being told, ah, now you're not part of us. You don't belong. You can't be in this religion anymore. or You can't be in this family anymore. What it all creates is a war with what is. War, 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 war. Demonizing the ones who turn everything inside out. Rather than recognizing that turning everything inside out and upside down is sometimes how we find our true selves and we find the spiritual path. You've probably asked yourself this question, many contemplatives have. Does religion create more good or more evil? Think about that. Really think of the history of religion. Do you think religion causes more good or causes more evil? More harm, more suffering? Could probably be argued either way, right? But if you think all of the sudden, if religion never was, never existed, how many wars would not have been fought? How many excommunications, demonizations, attacks would not have happened? Richard Rohr says new eyes have everything to do with seeing and thinking paradoxically. Grasping for the truth of something that seems a contradiction. He goes on to say, great dogmas of the church are almost always totally paradoxical. Think of Jesus, human and divine. Mary, virgin and mother. Hear that? Mary, virgin and mother. God, one, and three, the Trinity. Eucharist, bread, and Jesus. Because paradox undermines dual thinking at its very root, the dualistic mind immediately attacks paradox as weak thinking or confusion, separate from hard logic. The very modern phenomenon of fundamentalism shows an almost complete incapacity to deal with paradox and shows how much we have regressed. But today, thank God, what mystics have always known, great scientists now teach as well. And the church is trying to catch up, he says, after a long amnesia. This is so critical to get. 
If you're anything like me in the spiritual journey and the spiritual path, I have spent time pointing out the contradictions with the purpose of invalidating. <laughs> with the purpose of invalidating. This is inviting us into a new, deeper way of thinking, a more expansive way of being. And in fact, an invitation that I think is so critical to the future of humanity, to the future of the human race coexisting on this planet in peace. So I'm ready to take it on. I'm ready to grow up. He shares the passage, Wisdom 7, 21 through 27. All that is hidden and all that is plain, I have come to know through wisdom. Within her is a spirit intelligence, a spirit intelligent, unique, manifold, subtle, active, incisive, lucid, invulnerable, benevolent, dependable, unperturbed, and all-seeing. She pervades and permeates all things. She is the untarnished mirror of God's active power. She is one and makes all things new. And in each generation passes into holy souls. That's in the Bible. If there isn't anything else you like from the Bible, because some people have thrown the whole thing out. That passage has beauty in it. What a gift. What a gift. Richard Rohr says that wisdom sees things all at once and does not divide the field. That's the gift. When we think from our center of wisdom, when we see through the eyes of wisdom, through the heart of wisdom, it doesn't have a need to divide everything up. It doesn't have the need to go into duality to make an us and them a right or a wrong. It doesn't have a need for everything to make sense or match reality. It sees things as a whole and it gets the gifts that are there. He goes on to say this, scripture calls this subtle seeing she, which in a patriarchal culture is a way of saying alternative. So he's pointing out that in scripture, when the speaker is a she, when God is referred to as she or Lady Wisdom or Sophia, that's a way of saying alternative, an alternative consciousness. He goes on to say, Alan Watts says that the loss of paradoxical thinking is the great blindness of our civilization, which is what many of us believed happened when we repressed the feminine side of our lives as the inferior side. It was a loss of all subtlety, discrimination, and capacity for complementarity. So what's the benefit of spiritually maturing? What's the benefit of inviting in paradox and allowing it to be? He says that each one of us must learn to live with paradox or we cannot live peacefully or happily even a single day of our lives. In fact, we must even learn to love paradox or we will never be wise, forgiving, or possessing the patience of good relationships. We must learn to live with paradox. For anyone that thinks they don't need to live with paradox, that paradox isn't within us and around us, we're generally not engaging the observer self not able to see our own contradictions, showing it blind. Remember, wisdom sees things all at once and does not divide the field. So the paradox 
can either crucify us or it can set us free. And it is the battle between will and wisdom. But Charles Fillmore in going through the 12 powers of being, the 12 powers of awakening into the awakened self talks about wisdom and will and saying they need to be developed together, that they're not separate. You don't wanna have such a highly developed sense of will, right? Will, power, will, and very, very little wisdom. But the two together dance. Our loyalty to our identity or our self of belonging often overrides our need for alignment or sense of activity. And that's integrity. And that's fine as long as it doesn't blind us or cause us to block out expansive thinking. So we can live in integrity with our beliefs and also embrace paradox. But sometimes we get so headstrong, I'm this label or I'm that label, I'm this, but I'm not that that we actually shut down our thinking centers. We shut down our intuitive center, our heart center. We shut down the third eye seeing. I remember a long time ago in ministerial school, I took one of those tests. It's the test where you can find out what religion you are. Like if you don't think you know what religion you are, you can find out by taking this test. And what I mean by that is it goes through your belief system. You get to answer questions about what you think about God, the universe, yourself, Jesus, everything. You get to answer these questions and then it delivers to you the practice that most aligns with your thoughts. Now, I don't know if new thought is on there as an option now. It wasn't when I took it. But I remember the intrigue in taking this test. Do you know what you would align with? What do you think you would align with? We often align with things that we wouldn't guess. I remember specifically the answer to my quiz because it was non-duality. And at the time I knew nothing about non-duality and non-duality isn't like one of the world religions you hear of as far as I've ever seen. It's not like, oh, you can be a Catholic or a Christian or a fundamentalist or Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, but you can also be non-dual. And I remember thinking like, what is that? And I read a little bit about it and then I let it go. And I think one of the gifts of unity and one of the gifts of new thought is that with the practice of non-duality, you steer away from the airy fairy part of new thought that cannot be grounded and you get into the depths of new thought you get into the depths of a practice that has meditation that has mindfulness that has expansive thinking i'm going to put up after the service on our facebook uh, page and also we'll put it in the chat after the service, uh, a test that I found that is seems like it's probably similar to the one that I took so that we can all take it again. Anyone that wants to explore can see. But do you think about how much suffering is caused because we stick to our label? My label is so important. My label is more important than love. My label is more important than wisdom. My label is more important than you. My label is even more important than me. There's even so much self-hatred and self-discord caused when who we are doesn't fit the label we inherited or we want or we think we should have. Are we willing to emancipate ourselves and free ourselves? When this not the last election. Well, maybe it was the last election. When the last election rolled around, there was a, a website where you could do the same thing as this belief quiz, this religion quiz, and you could hop on there and say what you think about the issues that are facing the country today, that are facing our world today, that are facing our society. And you can say what you think. Okay, if this 
is the question, this is what I would vote or I would want my representative to vote or this is what I think or this is the side I would lean towards. And you got to answer each one of these questions. And then when you answered the question, it gave you all of the candidates, well, all the candidates from the side that you're choosing from, right? So if you're a Democrat, Democrats, if you're a Republican, Republican, but it gave you, and that's interesting, right? It should have given you all the candidates from all of them, <laughs> but it gave you all the candidates from the side that you're looking at. And it would tell you, you most align with this person. You most align with that person on that issue. And then you could click farther and you could go in to say, this is how this person voted on this issue in the past. And they voted on this issue this many times. That person changed their minds. They used to be like this and now they're like that. But you could go through and you could go, you could keep diving more deeply with each click to the point where you could just uncover how you really felt about the candidates, right? And then at the end, it tells you the candidate you would vote for if you were voting along the lines of what you say you believe. It says, okay, this is where you fit. Do you think I got the one that I fit with? That I think I fit with? I didn't. And I was like, that's not the one I want. I still want mine. I'm still picking mine. <laughs> but I was delivered into a different one. But it was fascinating and it was amazing and it was educational because you could start thinking beyond your own box. You could think, well, why does, what did my candidate, the one that I think I want, what did, what did he or she do? You know, and let me learn more about that. It gave expanded thinking opportunities. Hmm. It helped me look at huh, who I want to vote for, what I feel versus who I really align with. Not what someone says they represent, but what they actually do, how they actually follow through, what their actual history is of showing up in action. It was truly innovative. If we can develop systems like this moving into the future, and if we can embrace our paradoxes, we can open up more safely to explore our minds, our hearts, and our co-creation. We can bypass assumptions, alliances, presumptions, boxes, and boundaries, and get into expanded thinking. We can open our eyes and lead with our hearts. Richard Rohr says, most of the major teachings of the great religions do not demand blind faith as much as they demand new eyes. To the uninitiated, this demand always looks like blind faith. But it is, in fact, a different kind of light that allows or creates and even appreciates the shadows. Such light allows a compassionate, full, and patient reading of reality. It is often poets who see the truth and can communicate it best. It is often the poets who see the truth and can communicate it best. If we are to embrace our unity, if we are to co-create peace, I think it's going to take finding the poet within each one of us. And when I say the poet, I mean the artist, I mean the musician, the songwriter the seer. Because the language of art, the language of poetry, the language of music embodies the essence without restricting and including, without restricting and excluding. It invites and it includes. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that sometimes words or books, doctrine can leave you out, but a song can embody and invite you in spaces and places that you may not have been able to go to or you may not have agreed. You can agree when it comes to music and art and poetry without having to have the details nailed down. Richard Rohr goes on to say that Jesus has come to teach us and to free us. Jesus has come to teach us and to free us. How many of you are like me? 
grumbling sometimes at how the teachings of Jesus have been used to harm, to exclude, to demonize. Richard Rohr says, Western Christianity has tended to objectify paradoxes and dogmatic statements that demand mental agreement instead of any inner experience of the mystery revealed. At least we worship these paradoxes in the living collision of opposites we call Jesus, which is good. He goes on to say, the Christ has come to teach us about life and about ourselves. Jesus, as the icon of Christ consciousness, is the very template of total paradox. Human yet divine, heavenly yet earthly, physical yet spiritual, possessing a male body yet a female soul. Killed yet alive. Powerless yet powerful, victim, yet victor, failure, yet redeemer, marginalized, yet central, singular, yet everyone, incarnate, yet cosmic, nailed, yet liberated, resolving the great philosophical problem of the one and the many. He urges us to grow, to expand. The sad part is there is still a consciousness that tells people to believe in Jesus rather than to really believe in Jesus. He says to believe in Jesus without the cosmic mystery Jesus actually reveals and without the invitation and call to see the same truth in ourselves and all of creation. So will we take the invitation? Will we allow our minds to be expanded right here and right now to really do an inventory into how we use our teachings and our spiritual practice? There is a great invitation here and it is deep because we can either engage in a process of making people wrong, making ourselves wrong, or opening our eyes, and leading with our hearts. There is a great conversation happening in the world these days about the future of Christianity and whether or not it has one. There are many great spiritual teachers that are saying what's going to need to happen if Christianity is not going to die. And then there are a lot of others saying, how about let it die? It's caused more harm than good. How can we, in new thought, how can I, how can you, usher in the new paradigm with grace? I am proposing that you are perfectly designed for this leadership. You, me, we are perfectly designed for leading humanity gracefully into a new paradigm that asks a higher question and a bigger question. And that is, can we demonstrate the awakened consciousness, demonstrate the Christ? 
So let's take a breath now. And just take all of these thoughts, every bit of this that may seem heady, and just breathe into the heart center. Breathe into the space of union and communion. This space where we become humble before the practice. Inhaling and exhaling. Sweet spirit, I give up my limited beliefs for a deeper expanded experience of love. I give up my dogma to invite in wisdom. And I open up the power center of will within me that it may be tempered by grace. Allow in me to be born in this moment a new way of seeing and feeling, a new way of conversing so that I may get the gifts that are beyond argument, that are beyond right and wrong, beyond this and that, mine and theirs. That I may be about the great work of wholeness. I inhale and I exhale, breathing in to that space within me, that authentic space where I acknowledge the times in my life where I may have stood on the pedestal of being right that I may have torn something down with the intention of taking it away, rather than seeing that it may have actually been a portal. It may have actually been an invitation to experience my emancipation. Inhaling and exhaling, I loosen the reins of my mind and my thoughts to allow the holy experience of the now moment in so that I may come from this place, come through this place, and come to this place more consciously more frequently and that I may be about the business of sharing this with others. Inhaling and exhaling, we breathe into the silence. bringing our attention back to this now moment. By the power of this practice, may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings know they are born blessed and here to be a blessing. May all beings know God as love and themselves as emanations of this love. And so it is. <laughs>